Good morning. Welcome to our morning walk with the Apostles. This is Monday, April the 26th. It's a beautiful day here in Hereford. Warm, sun shining. We made it up to 90 yesterday, supposed to again today. Yes, we had wind with it, but we're still talking about we live in the panhandle of Texas. That's to be expected. Well, it's so good to have you with us this day. I hope that wherever you are, your day is a good one. And uh, let's start with a prayer, and then we'll get right back into looking at uh, the book of Acts, chapter 17. Would you bow? Loving Father, we thank you for the day and its blessings for keeping us through the night. We thank you for this new day that you have brought to us, and we pray that as we progress through the, the time of this day that we will keep in mind to look for opportunities to serve, to do your will, to sh show others your love and mercy, and to tell others about the good news of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, again for the word that you've given to us and for the ability that we have to study it, for the availability that we have to uh, have it in languages that we can read and understand, uh, and in some cases even multiple translations in the same language. Help us, Father, as we open your word, to open it and read it with an open heart and mind, that we might observe and see the truths that you've recorded for us, the teaching, the example, all the things that are there that pertain to life and godliness, that we might draw closer to you each day. Father, I pray you continue to be with those who are ill, recovering from surgery, uh, physical difficulties of any kind, and I pray that they might soon be restored to their health. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, we, we resume our examining of the second missionary journey of the Apostle Paul on this Monday morning walk. And we find Paul in the city of Athens, Greece. Paul was alone in Athens, the cultural and philo philosophical center of the Greco-Roman world. Much of the glory of Athens was already in the past, but in Paul's day, the city was still a force to be reckoned with. Many of the greatest thinkers, orators, and artists who ever lived had made Athens their home. The concept of democracy had been born in Athens. And in the process of conquering the world, the Romans had spread Athenian culture and the Greek language. Athens was still considered by many to be the greatest university center in the world. Now at that time there were three great university cities that existed. One was Athens. The other was across the Mediterranean to the south in Alexandria, Egypt. And the third was, interestingly enough, Tarsus, Paul's hometown. And I, per, I make that point simply to say Paul was familiar with a university town. If the brethren who brought Paul to Athens brought him by ship, which seems likely, they probably said their goodbyes at the seaport which was about five miles from the city itself. As Paul walked to Athens, one of the first sights he would have seen was the Acropolis. The word Acropolis is a Greek word combining the word for city and the word for high. Literally, Acropolis means the high city. In those ancient days, most cities of any size had their own acropolis. 
It not only served as a location for temples or libraries, etc., but also it was a refuge for the population to flee to in case of attack. In Greece, excuse me, in Athens, the Acropolis was crowned by the dazzling white and gold Parthenon, the temple dedicated to Athena, considered by many to be the most beautiful building ever fashioned by the hands of men. The Parthenon, or the word Parthenon, comes from the Greek word for virgin. This temple to Athena was a temple of the virgins dedicated to her. Outside of the Parthenon was a statue of Athena, the patron gar goddess of Athens. This image was so tall that, according to ancient writers, even from the seaport five miles away, one could see the sunshine reflecting off the point of Athena's spear. Now, there was a more famous statue of Athena inside the Parthenon, but there was also this one on the outside. Paul had asked the brethren who left him in Athens to tell Silas and Timothy to come to him as soon as possible, Acts 17, verse 15. Now perhaps Paul did not intend to begin his work in Athens until his team was reassembled. He could not, however, ignore the error and ignorance that he saw. Everywhere he turned, he would have observed heathen festivals and processions, sacrifices, and celebrations full of superstitious fears. He would have seen the uh, proliferation of idols and temples, including the temple to Zeus, the largest temple in the world of that day. Now, Zeus was considered to be the chief deity among the Greeks. The satirist Praetonius had written that it was easier to find a god in Athens than to find a man. Paul would probably have agreed. That is, Paul spoke about the fact that he had even passed by an altar with an inscription to an unknown God. Acts 17.23 And so verse 16 says that while Paul was waiting for them, Silas and Timothy, at Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was beholding the city full of idols. Now, Paul was not upset merely because of the existence of images. Before the idols were worshipers and sacrifices that had been left for these so-called gods. Every vase filled with withered flowers, every bowl of rotting fruit represented someone's heart. Today, visitors to Athens classify the ruins of that, that ancient city as art and architecture. When Paul beheld the idols and the magnificent temples, he did not see the beauty of architecture. He saw the ugliness of error. He did not see cultural progress. He saw spiritual pornography. He did not see enlightenment of the mind. He saw ignorance of the soul. Later, he would write to the church, uh, the congregation in Corinth, the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, 
They sacrifice to demons and not to God. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 20, A. You know, I can relate somewhat with Paul. When Linda and I lived in Donetsk, Ukraine, and teaching in the Ukrainian Bible Institute, we had multiple opportunities to see various Russian Orthodox church buildings. While they may have been beautiful from an architectural perspective, they were also centers of idolatry, representing man's departure from God's divine pattern. In particular, I recall a monastery in Kiev that we had opportunity to visit one summer when uh, our oldest daughter Kimberly was visiting with us. This monastery was famous in Ukraine. It had an underground catacomb that you could go into and we took advantage, I suppose you would say, of the opportunity to go into the catacombs. But it didn't take long for us to get a fill of what we were seeing. There were people all through the catacombs, stopped and on their knees in prayer in front of the, the tombs and the walls of, of the passageway, the burning of the it, candles and the incense was, a, in my estimation, a stench in the air. There were rotting flowers and other gifts that were there, and it was just so overwhelming as we witnessed all of this false, quote, worship, end quote, that was going on. And it got to the point where I caught our Katya's attention, our interpreter that was with us and all around, well, basically we considered her another daughter. And I said, Katya, does that sign say exit like I think it does? And she said, yes. And I said, I'm out of here. And of course, we all got out. Well, let's go back to Athens. How could a center of learning also be a center of superstition? Athens was a vivid demonstration of the truth of 1 Corinthians 1, 21. Quote, the world through its wisdom did not, and I might add, and cannot, come to know God, end quote. In fact, if you were to turn and read Romans 1, verses 8, 18 to 32, a divine commentary on what had happened in that enlightened city. So, so Paul was provoked by what he saw in Athens. How would we have responded if we had been Paul? Would we have felt overwhelmed? Would we have been discouraged, ready to give up? Would we have said, there's nothing I can do. There's just one of me and thousands of them. Well, instead of responding negatively, Paul did what he could to remedy the situation. So what could he do? He could preach the gospel. Although Silas and Timothy had not yet arrived, Paul began to preach. In fact, we cannot say for sure Silas and Timothy ever arrived in Athens. The next time they are mentioned is in chapter 18 and verse 5 at Corinth. However, 1 Thessalonians 3 verses 1 and 2 probably indicate that Timothy did rejoin Paul in Athens, but that Paul immediately sent him back to Thessalonica. And some speculate that Silas also rejoined Paul in Athens, but that Paul immediately sent him elsewhere, perhaps to Philippi. Both Silas and Timothy eventually, though, did rejoin Paul 
in Corinth, as we said. And then Luke tells us in chapter 17, or in, in verse 17, I should say, So he, Paul, was reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. Well, as we've seen, as Paul's custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. See verse 2. Saturday, on that Saturday, Sunday through Friday, he discussed biblical truths with any who happened to be present in the marketplace, the Agora. In other cities, the Agora was the cultural, commercial, and religious center of the city. In Athens, however, it was also the educational center where the philosophers met. Men like Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle had all taught in the Agora of Athens. In verse 21, Luke inserted this editorial note, quote, now all the Athenians and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing other than telling or hearing something new. End quote. Visitors came from all over the world to Athens to study. They claimed to be in search of truth. In reality, they were in search of the new and the novel. Philosophers have always been better at chasing ideas than reaching conclusions. The natural inclination of Athenians was to hear something new. It may not have been commendable, but it did give Paul a perfect opportunity to preach the gospel. Among those who argued with Paul in the Agora were adherents of the two major schools of thought in Athens. Verse 18a says, Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him, that is Paul. Let's talk about these two for just a minute before we close. The Epicureans were followers of the philosopher Epicurus. He lived from 340 to 270 BC. They are noted today for defining man's purpose for existence as, quote, the pursuit of pleasure, end quote. Now, by pleasure, Epicurean teachers meant the absence of pain and suffering. Regarding religion, Epicureans were materialistic deists. That is, they acknowledged the existence of gods, but thought that they were so far removed from the world as to exercise no influence on its affairs. Although Epicurean teachers did not define pleasure in terms of the senses, the philosophy had no real check on sensuality. Eventually, for some, the position deteriorated into the familiar philosophy, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. See 1 Corinthians 15, 32. Now today, the word epicure is used to refer to one who enjoys extravagance in food and drink. On the other hand, the Stoics were disciples of the philosopher Zeno. He lived from about 340 to 
265 BC. So you see he basically lived the same time as Epicurus. The Stoic's name came from the Greek word for porch, Stoa, S-T-O-A. Zeno had taught in the so-called painted Stoa, located in the Agora in Athens, and that was still their principal meeting place in Paul's day. Now, if you're like me, the term porch suggests a rather humble structure. Well, these porches on the Agora, in the Agora were elaborate structures, a covered colonnade opened on at least one side. The Stoics believed in duty as the highest good. They emphasized self-discipline and a denial of the flesh. Regarding religion, Stoics were materialistic pantheists. That is, God to them was an impersonal force permeating everything in the universe. They believed that fate determined everything in their lives and that they should be resigned to accept whatever happened. Now we use the word stoic today to refer to one who appears indifferent to physical or emotional pain. Epicurean philosophy ultimately deteriorated into extravagance, while stoic philosophy deteriorated into pride as it exalted the self-sufficiency of man. Though the Epicureans and the Stoics represented opposite views in Greek philosophy, the philosophies did have much in common. Both exalted man and his capabilities. Neither accepted the need for a personal God. Neither believed in a conscious existence after death. Both were uncomfortable with dogmatic statements about truth. And thus the adherents of both philosophies felt threatened by Paul's teaching. Well, we'll stop here, and tomorrow we'll continue looking at Paul's discussion with these two different schools of, Epi of Athenian philosophers in the city of Athens. Let's bow as we close this morning. Father, we're grateful for your blessings and your being with us. And again, we thank you for the day. We thank you for the teaching of your word that shows us Paul's dealing with the different groups that he came in contact with. And we pray that through this, we can learn how we can approach and be able to reach out to and teach different groups that we come in contact with. And may, Father, we examine your word in, in that light to see by example of Paul what to do and how to teach those we con come in contact with. We thank you so much for Jesus. We're so grateful that you planned from before the foundation of the world that he would come and that you went to the extraordinary means of providing for our redemption through his life, death, burial, and resurrection. And we're grateful, Father, that you, he's now seated at your right hand as our intercessor. Help us, Father, to influence our world, beginning where we are, and reach out and teach and touch and be an influence for you. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Will you enjoy this beautiful day, wherever you are? And Lord willing, we'll be back here tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock to again take another morning walk with the apostles.